Okay, here we go. Third uh, lesson, 4C on industry trends. So it has three trends, voice, cars, and deep learning. It's relatively clear these are three important areas of modern uh, the modern world is evolving. And this just has some details of those trends. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. And we'll start off with voice. Um, it's, voice has not been heralded um, quite as much as some of the other technologies. It is, of course, enabled by deep learning, which has drastically increased the quality of voice recognition. All right, here is a pretty picture of interaction between the human and the computer. I use punch cards in whenever it was, 1961 to maybe uh, 70. Um, and uh, then there was, of course, keyboards. I'm not, this is a computer accessed by a keyboard. Is ENIAC the most famous initial computer? I used, I really did not like paper tape. I used paper tape back in 1965 or 6 when I was at Cambridge as a graduate student. And it's terrible because whenever you wanted to make a change, you had to change the whole tape. And you ran off a whole new tape to make one change. Um, because mainframe computers are what I was using it for. Now we have the uh, different types of inputs, the trackball, the joystick. Then we had the revolution of the microcomputers or mini computers. The IBM PC, I remember when those first came out, how we were working on developing ways of using them in physics and things like that back in the, whenever that was, 1983 probably. So that was after, that was the uh, PC Junior and things like that. Then we had Windows, and I still remember an IBM executive telling me, telling everybody with a laugh that Windows went serious and everybody liked the command line. In fact, still some people prefer command lines, especially with shells and Linux and things like that. Then we had mice, and then mice and touch and things on the smartphones, and then cameras, etc. And now we have voice, Siri from Apple. And Alexa from Amazon. And Alexa sort of not so much driven by um, it itself quality. It's driven by the brilliant um, deployment of Alexa and then the voice on a speaker. So you can use that speaker to play on demand what you want. All right, so let's look into the, in more detail about this voice revolution. Well, here is the pretty obvious but very important reason to prefer voice. It's almost four times as fast as typing. Um, it's also hands-free and so on. It has one huge problem, which is not mentioned here. It's not so easy to use voice in open environments. So when you're on a, sitting on a plane or sitting in a in a meeting and you're trying to get some work done, then you can, can't can really use voice very easily. Um, so it's of course keyboard free, it can be personalized to your voice and your, your context of life and things like that. And it is not hierarchical, it is random access because it's much more general, it is requires just a microphone and a speaker. And um, possibly it's actually easier to implement than other forms of input, which require keyboards and things like that, and displays. Voice doesn't require a display. And you must have deep learning and natural language recognition. And that's what's enabled this to, to go so fast. Here is Andrew Ng, a wonderful Great person in the area of machine learning and related areas. He uh, uh, now in the machine, just I think left Baidu 
to set up his own company and get another one of his own companies. He did set up, most initially known for setting up Coursera. Then he went ahead, the lab for Baidu in Silicon Valley, and now I think he's doing his own thing. Anyway, he is an incredible pioneer in machine learning. And he makes this important point that 95%, which is roughly where we are now, to 99% is an enormous gain. And because it is so good at 99% that you will always use it. And of course, you better not wait 10 seconds every time. So you have to have very good response. There's not much point in speaking at 150 words per minute if you have you actually speak 40 words before you get a result on the first one of them. Here is our detailed analysis of Cortana, which is Microsoft's version. It's sort of interesting. You mentioned Google and Microsoft so far, but according to this slide, there's some reason to believe that Cortana is actually the most advanced. It's one of these assistants, like Siri and Google Assistant, and it. Uh, Actually, isn't as good a contextual conversation in some ways because we believe Google has a better database. Um, and Cortana exceeded humans, but I think they all do that now because they've now just reached this human level of 95% or so, which you can, uh, which you uh, need to do human compatible recognition. Now it has a server, of course, so does Amazon have a wonderful cloud, as does Google. It has Microsoft Office, which is a good framework for, for using it in. I don't like typing at Microsoft, and that gives it a big, some boost. And um, so there's some reason to believe it will be successful. This is perhaps more interesting. Uh, Microsoft has a significant uh, HoloLens effort, which is a uh, Virtual reality and augmented reality uh, approach. And voice obviously is important there, because you can't really have a virtual reality interface with a keyboard if you just put a heads up display or something on somebody. So here's the overall cloud architecture. Here we have the user input, or maybe it comes from a machine. And then we actually go through classic um, steps. We do a machine learning or deep learning. I wouldn't use HD Insiders, they're not as good as some of the other systems. Um, stream Analytics, Azure Stream Analytics, the data will be streamed in. And I would actually put that, um, some says ahead of a dupe, because you have to stream it and then process it. And But Azure Machine Learning is pretty powerful, but so do all the other people's machine learning, especially Google. Then you have these giant data stores, the data lake for Azure or SQL data warehouse, these are large, multifaceted data stores. And then we have um, more sophisticated information management. Remember, it goes from data, which is sort of the raw stuff without much, um, much easy, without it being processed enough to draw many conclusions. And then you go to information before you go to knowledge and wisdom. And Event Hub is just uh, one of the technologies that goes with the stream analysis to um, process streaming data. And then you have metadata to describe the, the data and data factories to build a whole system, data processing system. Actually, this is not the world's most intelligent uh, slide, but it is at least Gives you a good idea of what type of system you have to build. And of course, all this stuff here you learn about in these first two, you learn about in cloud computing. And this one you learn about in machine learning. And of course, you learn about Hadoop in cloud computing, actually, and stream analytics. Those are all, those are the platforms. So the platform machine learning, whether it be Hadoop or stream analytics, will be taught in your cloud computing class. All right, here's a pretty interesting graph. It um, shows um, the words recognized by a machine and um, the accuracy, which, um, well, actually, I mentioned 95%, but I think it's so. But then, when the way it's measured for this graph is 90%, and this shows the enormous progress in 1970. We had 10 words up to 
a million words in 19, in 2010 at 70% accuracy, and now 8 million words at 90% accuracy. And of course, you have to work on these things like background. I mean, most voices actually have heavy background, and that's not so easy to do. Okay, here is a sort of rather peculiar way of illustrating the, the importance of voice. These are typical things you use to uh, query the voice assistants, call mom, call dad, call, call Fred, or navigate home, or get a pizza or something like that. And these are just uh, showing how around 2013, um, the Google Trends, then the number of searches for those words increased significantly. So that's 35 times since 2008 uh, is the rise of the trending of voice related queries. Quite why you would do a Google query for your voice command, I'm not certain. All right, here are some search um, numbers 1 in 10 from Baidu in September 14, 25% for the Bing taskbar 2016. Um, Andrew Ng predicting in 2020, 50% of searches are going to go to images or speech. Um, Siri handles a billion requests a week. Echo is the fastest growing speaker, and it probably still is, and it has 25% of the speaker market. That's pretty, uh, uh, pretty interesting. And Android has one in five of its searches on mobile devices being voice searches. So that says it's on. Pretty non-trivial uh, functionality getting significant use. Not dominant use, but significant. Here's a rather surprising number given the success of Alexa and the fact that uh, Google, uh, Amazon's uh, Echo uh, ecosystem of, of loudspeakers and uh, Alexa part loudspeakers is that Alexa is far worse than Google at uh, voice queries. In fact, large factors, six to three times uh, better as Google is. So, I mean, the, this, and it also is pretty bad, bad, sad how bad Alexa really got 13% of travel questions right, as Google got 72%. So, that's sort of, these are big numbers. And Google is sort of flat at around 70%. And then Amazon, done pretty bad on. Travel and finance, and not quite so bad on automotive, but it's still three times worse than Google. So, and they were each, this was from 5,000 questions in 2017. So, I'm sure Amazon will find a way of explaining this and will anyway, even if they can't, I'll improve Alexa to be comparable to Google. And this sort of puts this in writing. Here are the three areas. And it points out Alexa does better when you do things like uh, automotive, which are retail related or, or retail questions. Um, they claim that Google's um, database is so much better that it allows them a much better interpretation. It's not the actual voice recognition, it's the combination of voice recognition with the database that you're query. Um, so. That's, this thing says that Google is better. So we now know well, Amazon is better because of Alexa. We had another comment that Microsoft was better due to Cortana. And now we have a comment that Google is better because it uh, has a higher capability. We'll see. Definitely all going to end up very good. Here is uh, the plot against your age of, of what you're interested in. Actually, it's pretty solid interest in voice. It's lowest of 15% for the uh, uh, the 55-year-olds, uh, but then it's 51% uh, for the teenager people. But it's still pretty high in all cases. And the tourists, the worst of 50% of of the people not being interested for the older gener oldest generation here, but the youngest generation. 84% are interested, so that's not surprising. That says voice has a huge customer demand waiting to be satisfied. All right, now we come to cars. 
the next, the, the second of our topics. Okay, um, this is a relatively short discussion. Um, and probably we should try to do better on this because autonomous cars are very important. There are all sorts of companies doing trucks and cars and ride shares, automatic ride shares, automatic personal self-driving cars, etc. And here is a pretty picture of uh, the automobile, noting it was dominated by Europe initially, the early innovations. Henry Ford and others uh, introduced uh, the mass, uh, well, mass manufacturing techniques. And then 1950s was the golden age. I was in England at that time and I didn't see any golden age. Um, <coughs> but um, this is a nice number. Eight out of the ten of the Fortune, top ten of the Fortune 500 or either oil or cars. Uh, it would not be true any longer. We know at one stage, even startup technology companies are worth more than General Motors and things like that. I'm, I'm sure Tesla is worth a lot more than any other of the traditional car companies. Because that may all collapse, but uh, that shows what people think. Then we have the maturing of the industry. Um, Auto safety issues, emission issues, which of course driving electrical cars. Then the Japanese start exploiting their superiority in manufacturing. And then we have all these uh, failed, mostly failed consolidations. Uh, hybrids do not really work out in the USA. And um, then we had this recession with terrible bankruptcies and bailouts in 2008 and a bit longer. All right, here we are, rising again, because the USA tends to innovate better than other places. And we have Tesla, GM, and Ford all doing self-driving and electric cars, and so is Google and Apple. Of course, not, not in the collaboration, they're doing it separately. Then we have the big ride-hailing battle between Lyft, Uber, and Didi. Lyft certainly has, a, which is not mentioned here. Um, is doing a significant uh, self-driving initiative. But I just read they were going to insist there will be a driver in every car, even if it was self-driving. This comes from a presentation I listened to from IDC at the Consumer Electronics Show this January 2017. And this just tells you all the things you have to do. To do anything real, you have to do just lots of things. You knew technology, which is hardware, software, services, and the connectivity. You have to have connected cars, and you have to connect people to themselves, etc. And of course, to the automobile car industry, we know Tesla has a rather virtualized uh, dealer network, pretty controversial, tries to be attacked by the traditional automotive industry. And we say the dealers obviously are not so happy if you remove them. And we have to have services after and before. And like I have to take my um, Tesla into Indianapolis. Have anything you like done, but it's not so convenient. And then there are all these other services which are needed: safety insurance, diagnostics, monitoring of things, entertainment, purchasing, and payments. Um, my Tesla, actually, I just I just was told to change the battery on my on my um, electronic key. It my car barked at me and ordered me to change my battery. Then we have a lot of digital transportation efforts. Uh, they started, I think, in Shanghai with um, using uh, digitally connected taxis and use them to monitor the overall situation on roads. And um, obviously, if you could, in fact, I see that the school district has some app to tell you what where the buses are. Didn't work initially. So obviously, there's enormous possibilities to digitally report uh, open parking spaces, um, criminal activities, and accidents, and so on. 
And there's also the dreadful regulation, which is at all possible levels and is guaranteed to make you do something, is certainly guaranteed to make stop you from doing things. Whether it actually enables you to do anything better is not so always obviously correct. All right, deep learning. Possibly the most spectacular of all the modern technologies is deep learning. Has a nifty name and some remarkable results. Okay, so this is a general comment on not just deep learning, but analytics, which is, if you like, machine learning. And it's pointing out that of the various types of data, over essentially half through um, 90% of that data remains to be properly processed. And um, these are three different areas, location-based data, maps, and well, again, transportation, things that uh, where the position in space really matters. Retail, Europe or US, manufacturing, smart machines, and, and, uh, and 3D, driving 3D printers on demand and things like that. The European Public Center and the U.S. Healthcare, and these last few I have rather poor use of um, digital technology and data analytics. Remember, the orange is the current use is being used, and the gray is still an opportunity. And even in the most use case, location-based data. There's over 40% of the capability is, remains to be captured. So there's plenty of work to be done and plenty of jobs for your data science graduates. Here's a useful technical diagram. We have problem types, classification, prediction, generation. We have machine learning techniques. These are dear to my heart, clustering through the deep belief networks and with other neural nets. These are all giant optimization algorithms. All of these are giant optimization algorithms. And a deep learning network has various case, special cases, such as convolutional networks. Conventional neural nets are, of course, just the same as deep, but less sophisticated. Support vector machines is how you used to do classification. Now that's been often taken over by deep networks. And here we might have old fashioned. Uh, well, actually, the first few are old-fashioned. Merging, sorting, search, and regression. Graph is not old-fashioned, because graph is really rapidly developing at the moment. Because the old algorithms are so inefficient, now with large data, you need more efficient algorithms than that those have been developed. Uh, we have various forms of optimization, nonlinear, chi-squared, linear programming, signal processing, which are fast Fourier transforms or related algorithms, and of course, Decryption and encryption are both very important. All right, and then we have these use cases, resource allocation, making predictions. <coughs> Applying your machine learning to data from engines as they fly across the Atlantic or the Pacific. Personalized information, that's personalized medicine. Discovering new trends, what is the, what is the hot word of the day? Might be related to the hot important topic of the day, which will allow you to make money in some way or other. Forecasting the world. Price and optimization. That's for the retail people want to take all the data they have and use it to predict how they should price um, merchandise to get it to, so it doesn't build up and yet you get as much as you can for it. And triaging is, of course, of making the best of a bad job. And uh, so anyway, all these use cases uh, are meant, uh, have some combination of sophisticated machine learning and standard old-fashioned analytics uh, of the, let's calculate the mean and the standard deviation style. All right, so uh, this, uh, this comes from a very impressive McKinsey report on the age of analytics competing in a data-driven world just came out. Uh, they had another uh, important report, very important for data science, which I actually has discussed in the jobs uh, section of this, uh, this um, presentation. 
And it explains how you can use deep learning to effectively do the jobs or help the jobs of various types of people. Often the embarrassment is that you might be able to take over the jobs of currently done by real people, like meeting customers. I'm sure our deep learning network can find the right words to say to our customers they're walking through the door. And they can answer the questions about, uh, at least some of the questions about the um, about products and services. Of course, some are not answerable. Um, all right, so that's, but the main thing is that this analysis anyway expects that um, oh, somewhat more than a third of the uh, capabilities needed in various areas uh, are covered by uh, deep learning. All right, here we have 20 groups of uh, activities which are paid, to people are paid to do at the moment, such as guiding uh, work, uh, documenting, monitoring, um, analyzing, so on, doing administrative issues. And there has got a pretty large amount of wages here. Um, and um, here is the types of technologies you would use in your um, deep learning system. And here's the number of occupations, 191 occupations here involve guiding, directing, or motivating. Uh, 26 involve operating vehicles. And you, know, you can obviously see um, um, certainly a deep learning system being able to do a much better job documenting or recording information. And they're also going to possibly be self-driving tractors and, and bulldozers and things like that. Um, so anyway, we have these 20 things here, the amount of wages here. And um, actually here, no, the other is the biggest. And you note know, the, the types of work this is. Um, natural language is actually the largest category, although sometimes um, other things are being used. But here it's all text, um, voice to text, or, or, or text, or under, text, or text to interpret the uh, uh, meaning. All right. Here we have the last slide, which basically expands on the, the previous one. Um, and it basically tells you for a certain type of person, what fraction of that time could be automated. 28% for administrative assistance. Let me think, 51% for a customer service rep. That's not too surprising, you could use deep learning for that. Um, interesting one here is lawyers, 31%. And again, nearly all of this, and this is a reasonably conservative, this is all <coughs> NLP, natural language processing dominated. I think every single one of these NLP is over 50% and some of it's dominant. Like this one here, dominant the NLP. This thing has generating novel patterns and categories, which is this uh, blue thing here. I'm not quite certain what that would be. Um, Multiple is an easy one to understand, that's the gray one. All right, so this is just the last slide in this uh, deep learning thing, saying that deep learning is expected to have huge impact on many uh, occupations. And as people like Elon Musk like to point out, it has possibly devastating uh, impact on the availability for work, because deep learning and digital assistants are likely to take over a lot of the lower level tasks now done by human employees. That's a, obviously a pretty alarming point and worthy of important discussion. Uh, but we're not going to do that here. We're just going to be bounding on with our excitement because although it's very sad the jobs are being lost, we're here training people to work with the systems which will be unfortunately contributing to job loss in some areas. The job gains in the data science area is enormous, but those are, but uh, what people want is to, to avoid the job losses in manufacturing and retail and, 
um, secretarial areas, which are which tend to be threatened by uh, these um, deep, these machine learning and deep learning technologies. Thank you very much. This is the end of 4C, which is the end of the trends. Wow.